Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity to do the next time you visit? Something other than sitting around and answering the same questions over and over again like we always seem to do? Let me tell you about some books that I discovered that changed the last visit I had with mom tremendously. They're called Two Lap Books. They are simple, read aloud books for memory challenged adults. You see, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementias gradually lose their ability to initiate communication with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, reading books together can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Best of all, reading these books together will very likely bring out memories that you can share together. I've made it super easy for you guys to check out these books. The link to the Amazon page is in the show notes, so give it a click. I know you and your loved ones will get a tremendous amount of enjoyment together reading these books. Mom enjoyed them, her friends enjoyed them, and I enjoyed an afternoon with them like I haven't had in a very long time. With the winter months coming, Mom and I won't be able to go outside on our little adventures, so we'll definitely be reading these books a lot more as the colder weather envelops us and keeps us inside. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Peel. I am the sales director and one of the owners of Movement Academy. We are based in the New Orleans area and we have an amazing doctor recommended senior exercise program that helps push off signs of dementia and Alzheimer's. And it just happens to be, that's what we're talking about today. So uh, thank you, Jennifer, for having me on again for uh, part two. <laughs> yes, we, uh, um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, from our uh, nutrition one back in May. That's yeah, true. May. So there's been a lot of uh, research into how exercise can help us live longer and better, especially preventing Alzheimer's and dementias. And you sent me an article on obesity and dementia. And mm-hmm. there's great concern that our obesity epidemic is going to pave the way for a worsening epidemic of Alzheimer's and dementias. So... Can you give me the highlights of that article? Yeah, definitely. Plus, you sent me the one about uh, skinny fat mm-hmm. and, and and body type linked to dementia. So, you know, they haven't figured out the direct correlation with why fat specifically um, is an issue, it, but it goes all around to just the risk factors. You know, the risk factors of heart disease, risk risk factors of um, diabetes, risk factors of cholesterol are all related to brain health, which has a lot to do with blood flow. So as we know, when we're obese and then we start to have uh, arteriosclerosis and our arteries get clogged, blood doesn't flow as well to all parts of the body and the brain being an, an important part of that. So if the brain is not getting nutrients, the, the brain is not getting oxygen able to get rid of carbon dioxide, well, it's not going to function very well at all. So 
we got to make sure our heart is healthy, which has to do with eating less fat and having less weight on us, or less really fat on us, not necessarily weight, which is kind of related to it. But that's really a big part of it. And then, you know, we talk about uh, loss of muscle mass, which then has to do with body composition and sarcopenia, which is a natural happening in the body as we age, we lose muscle mass. But we can work on that by doing things like resistance training and working out and exercising. Does it mean that we'll, we're not going to lose muscle mass? No. And that's, that's what happens. Cognitive decline is natural. Sarcopenia is natural. But we can slow that down by doing things like resistance training, which also helps out uh, parts of our body like our executive function and short-term memory. So all those things together, it really is not just one avenue. Just like there's not one specific type of exercise that is fantastic. You've you got to do it all. So that's kind of the really the main idea that we, we talk about with it. Well, I just got back from my cardio weight training class, so I'm on the right track with that one today. Yeah, sure. So oh, sure. give me an example. How does exercise help your executive function? And maybe give us a quick definition of that for anybody who's not... 100% certain of that term. Right. Good Good point. Good point. Because uh, sometimes when we think executive function, maybe we're thinking um, like CEO. What does the CEO do? What kind of executive functioning is, is, is that person doing? But executive function is really the, the basics of humanity. Like how do you get out of bed? How do you brush your teeth? Uh, putting on your clothes? It's things like that that right now we take for granted. But for someone who has dementia, who has Alzheimer's, uh, cognitive decline, that's a challenge every single day. You know, can I get out of bed? Can I put my shirt on correctly? What is this piece of cloth right here in my hand? Why do I even have a shirt? <laughs> and and you know, you know from your experience. So... That's what exercise has a big impact on is being able to still have these executive functions in memory and then of course the speed of processing. You know, how fast are we able to understand what someone is, is telling us? Um, that's a huge piece of it. So the resistance training helps to improve executive function and short term memory. Uh, coordination training obviously helps improve complex body movements. And for someone with dementia, complex body movement could be um, picking down and picking up your keys. I mean, that, that, that could be termed against a relative of a complex body movement. Um, and they all affect different neurocognitive networks uh, along the way. Yeah, I've watched my mom struggle with clothes. She sits down to put on pants, and you can see with her advanced Alzheimer's that she's thinking about how to put them on, whereas we just kind of jump into our pants or we don't really think about it unless we get all tangled up, and that's just normal. Right. No, you have, you have normal clumsiness at times. Yeah, but it's just like not paying attention. Yeah, but you're, you're right. You're right. So the things we take for, we do take for granted as, as that, put on pants. I mean, that, that's, you have to plan that into their day. That's true. So, so, I've got a statistic that says people who don't exercise are more likely to develop dementia or Alzheimer's, and women are nearly twice as likely to develop it without exercising. We don't really know why the memory is affected more in women Correct. than men, but you know that's definitely something that women need to pay attention to. We all need to pay attention to. But you were talking about doing a variety of exercise, and I know women have a tendency to just focus on cardio, burning off calories because they ate that cookie or drank the wine. Right. Why specifically should we mix it up? Well, there's a, a lot of reasons, and women also, there's a big uh, um, disease out there called osteoporosis that is more common in women, which is your bone density. And when we do resistance exercises, and we're talking resistance exercises of between eight to 12 repetitions of a weight that is appropriate, meaning you're only able to do another one or two repetitions beyond that 
eight or 10 or, or 12 repetitions. It's not taking the five pound dumbbells and doing squats and stopping at 10. And that's, that doesn't do anything for you. So it's that which helps build bone density, which also then helps to push off things like osteoporosis, which happens as we age. Obviously, nutrition is a big part of that. We're not going to get go down that road too much. But that resistance training, also those complex movements help to build the brain cells. And for women, you're, you're not going to get big. Uh, I, I promise you, it's not going to happen. Uh, and there's three reasons for that. One of them is called uh, your hormones, your testosterone. You don't have as much as a man. So you're not going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, Lou Ferrigno. Um, <laughs> you don't eat as much generally as a man and three you don't do enough repetitions as we'll say a, a, a typical male uh, in the gym and, and those three things combined well you're not going to get there I mean, you're just not going to get there especially as you age and your hormones are changing you're definitely not going to all of a sudden go yeah look at me today <laughs> I, it, it doesn't happen it's, it's not going to happen. If it does, please contact me, and um, we're going to go make a bazillion dollars together. But it's not going to happen. Now, even the, the actual female bodybuilders at my gym never looked like the guys. And in clothes, some of them look pretty hot. <laughs> not that I, you know. Right. So that's how you change your body composition. And not that we want to go down this road, but changing your body composition is what it's about. So it, it's about dropping your body fat, which is then going to help you, that's your, your reduce your risk factors. And that's what we talk about with obesity is really your body fat. It wasn't just specifically your weight. You know, as uh, I, I say many times, 150 pounds at 30% body fat looks drastically different than 150 pounds at 15, but it's 150 pounds. You stay on the scale and, and if you just go by that scale number, hey, it's the same exact weight, but they don't look the same. No, they don't function the same either. They don't function the same either, exactly, but they weigh the same. So people get caught up on what's that weight number, and, and that's the wrong number to be caught up on. No, see how your clothes fit. So yeah. we talked a little bit the other day about how di having diabetes can more than double your risk of Alzheimer's and dementias, and the risk for diabetics developing some for form of dementia can be as high as 74%. And this has, I know we have, this has to do with blood sugar and exercise mm -hmm. helps our body process blood sugars better, right? right? Am I right. on the right path there? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I know, I actually read something interesting yesterday that our brains actually like the energy from lactic acid better than glucose. I had never read or heard that. Uh, that, I haven't, haven't read that one either. I haven't read that one either. <laughs> that one was convert, interesting. We convert everything to glucose. That we have to, we digest glucose, but and that's where protein helps with satiety. Is that it takes longer to break that down to glucose uh, is what the body needs for for energy. Um, yeah, that, that's that's new for me. Yeah, it was in a book called The Unbreakable Brain on hmm. different things to do obviously to protect your brain and like I said I hadn't remembered reading that before and I thought I'd run that one past you so you guys have a program an online program is it specifically for seniors or for everybody the way we have it set up uh, is specifically for uh, our active agers that's what we call our, our active aging program and regardless of someone's mobility they can use the program uh, whether they're chair bound, um, they're kind of semi mobile, maybe they need assistance walking, or they're just a little slow, or they're fully mobile, um, like like you, Jennifer, and, and like my mom, who's uh, 73. You know, she has no no problems with anything. So it what it does though, it's set up by uh, our doctor team to specifically work on the areas that we talked about that are going to help with executive function, that are going to help with speed of processing and of memory because it's their resistance exercises, their object control. You know, when's the last time you threw a ball up with your left hand and tried to catch it up above your head? For some people, it's pretty tough. Or even just using your feet, just passing the ball with the inside of your foot to someone. You know, you're not going to go out and, and be the next uh, greatest soccer player. That's not the point. 
is how do you control your body? How are you able to receive and then go ahead and deliver you know, objects, uh, coordination, agility, um, which are kind of fun. And that's what a lot of our seniors enjoy doing, or as you were saying, Jennifer, doing like a side shuffle. You side shuffle, you do a drop step, you turn your body around and, and you move. And that's kind of a typical movement in life. You know, when we get out of the car, we have to go laterally. We're not just going linearly. We have to step to the side, turn our bodies around, use our lower body, push up, maybe balance a little bit, and get out of the car. So for some people, again, that's a challenge. So how can we make that easier? And really that's what the program is about. We encompass everything so you don't have to think about it. Just do it right there on your phone, on your device, from anywhere you are, 10 minutes a day. We guarantee that in 10 minutes a day for 30 days, your life's going to completely change. Guarantee it. What was interesting is you talked about the side shuffle and back in June, I participated in the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Move for Minds program. And they ran us through an exercise program. And there were two exercises, one of which I swear I've never had a brain cramp, but these exercises totally gave me a brain cramp. The first one right. was the football shuffle. So you're shuffling mm-hmm. in the middle, and the trainer or the instructor will give you a verbal direction so you know jump forward go back you know so you always move they say go forward so you go forward and then back to center then they'd say right right and back to center and then they'd throw in the you know forward left and you have to do this quick shuffle on this moving and thinking it's like bleh (laughs) it was quite challenging yeah and the other one was um you had to spell your name and burpees were vowels and the jump squat were consonants, and I've never been so happy not to have too many vowels in my name. <laughs> well, that's, that's just pure torture is what those things are. I've seen a number of those. But, yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's, it's coordination. Well, and you had to think, too. That was yeah. the challenge. And you mentioned the other day about thinking, paying attention while you're working out. And I, I made sure to do that better today because a lot of times when I'm working out, it's easier to let my mind wander to – whatever I got to take care of when I get home from the gym instead of focusing on these 15 pound dumbbells and the, right. you know, bicep curls. Cause it's heavy. And then I thought, no, I need to focus on the movement. Like you were saying. So that was, it, it was less, it was more challenging to actually concentrate on what I was doing than let my mind wander. So I thought, found that interesting this morning as well. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a number of reasons for it. Number, I would say the number one reason why you want to concentrate, obviously, is safety. That's and, true. And basically, you know, injury prevention. You don't want to hurt yourself. Um, heavy weight is a relative term. So whatever your heavy weight is, if you're underneath it in some way, shape, or form, and you're not paying attention, it doesn't take much to shift your pelvis one way or the other if you have doing squats, for example, and then your lower back is, is, is injured. It's not so, happy. Right. So the, the program that you were telling us about, uh, you said it was twelve ninety nine a month? It's twelve ninety five a month. And right now we're giving it so the first month is actually fifty percent off. So you go to movementacademy.net dot com dot net and click on uh, active aging program. You can scroll down, you can get yourself a free report if you want that's included with it. Just click on the uh, the purchase, you'll enter the code MEMORY, M-E-M-O-R-Y, and then that code will get you 50% off your first month, no contract, available anywhere, anytime, right there on whatever device that you're currently using. That's awesome. So, and we talked the other day about this would be a good program for caregivers to use for themselves to reduce their stress and their keep their health up, but to also do with their loved one because right. it will help tire them out. It'll help keep their functions as stable as possible for a while, and it might help reduce some of the challenges that caregivers have. So I like that. I'm going to definitely check that out. Absolutely. When we're done. Yeah. You and it's more fun. If yeah. You can, if you can do something together with a person you're caring for. They're going to respond. You're going to be, respond. There's a natural wanting to uh, push each other a little bit, challenge each other. You know, if someone's doing uh, eight repetitions and you can only get six, well, hey, you know, I, I want to I do eight of those. 
And it constantly changes, meaning that every month you're going to get a new phase so that you have new exercises to do. Create your own exercise list right there at your fingertips every time. So it, that keeps the mind occupied and, and interested. That's true. So you got any last bit of advice for caregivers, people with um, you know, mild cognitive impairment that are trying to prevent it from getting worse? Absolutely. The, the message is start today. Do it today. You, know, you can't change necessarily what happened three weeks ago or three years ago, but starting today makes an impact on tomorrow and the rest of your life. So don't wait any longer. That's true because it's easy to put it off. It is easy. And when you can think about it, the CDC says in 11 minutes a day, you'll have a positive effect on your cognitive function. you got 11 minutes. Everybody's got 11 minutes, I promise. Then you can just start so. easily with a walk around the block. Yes. That's what I do with yes. my mom. I take her out on little mini adventures. We're blessed to have some regional parks close by, really close to where she's at. And we just walk. You know, she likes the sun. She likes to look at the trees. And so the walking's mm-hmm. good, the air, Perfect. sunshine. Perfect. But this, your program, I don't know if I could be able to, <clears throat> pardon me, I don't know if I'll be able to get her to do it because she's pretty far along in Alzheimer's and she's pretty stubborn. But it might well, be worth uh, it a try. It, it, again, it's, you're right. In, in that regards, how much cognitive function can be built? Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? But doing the variety of, of exercises does keep you occupied and from having to do the same walk over and over. And, uh, and she's still well from the physical standpoint of, of muscular development, sarcopenia. There's, it still makes an impact on that. Yeah, that's true. Cause she's physically fine. Right. Um, walks fine, you know, eats fine, but just no memory. <laughs> well, even better. She won't remember doing it. So, Oh, this is new. That's yeah. true. <laughs> I just have to get her to do it. She's not, if I, I find if she's concerned that she won't be able to do it. And this is with anything, you know, any of the little craft projects. I mean, they right. do, they'll bounce a beach ball around all the residents. She never does any of that stuff. She just sits around and talks, <clears throat> excuse me, with her other, her other friends, which, you know, that's great. I'm glad they can talk to each other about God knows what. <laughs> Um, one know. of these days I'm going to sneak in and catch them and find out what it is they talk about and how often does it repeat? Cause I'm just curious, and, <laughs> you know, but they're renovating right now. So everything is kind of in disarray and the, the dining area that they eat in is under reconstruction. So the, I don't find them sitting there cause there's nothing to sit on at the moment, but when they get it all put back together, I'm going to, I'm going to sneak in and, work my way around and find out what they're talking about and might be able, I wonder if I can I don't know I'll try to get maybe some of the other residents she's good if other residents do stuff so socialization is important so yeah they could do it all together yeah we could try it together. before the weather gets too bad right now it's really nice it's the best time of year in California warm days cool mornings and evenings you're probably yeah, we're not, not there yet yeah I was gonna say, you're probably not there yet in Louisiana we're not there. Hopefully, get? we get there by Christmas. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. <laughs> oh, Maybe. Yeah, we had a very hot summer with lots of smoke. All the fires. Oh, yeah. yeah, we had a. I'm trying to get back into walking the dogs because it was so hot and so smoky. You just didn't want to go outside. So, right. you know, right. now the dogs got to get back into shape. <laughs> yeah. I have three of them. The oldest one needs to get back into shape. So we're working on him. Going around the Very block. Good. We went out with all three dogs last night because the two the two younger ones are fast, and it motivated him. I can see it motivated him. See? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're mammals. They're mammals. That's true. They're mammals. You know? And it was beautiful last night. So I appreciate this input. You know, like I said, I've been reading Welcome. so much on how exercise is, you know, beneficial to your brain. I mean, you can't ignore it. If you try, no. it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, and it's, it's all ages. I know we're specifically talking here about the the aging population, but for all ages, especially with, with kids, academic performance, middle age and their jobs, 20, it doesn't matter. It, the same science applies or a human being. So, Sounds terrific. Get out there. 
Well, I appreciate again you enjoy your beer festival, although the new studies say that uh, no amount of alcohol is safe for your brain anymore. Well, I'm glad I'm an uh, ongoing experiment for that. <laughs> See, I like my sugar, so I don't drink, but I do, I do partake a little bit in the baked goods, but I learned how to make them healthier. Well, have our vices. We all do. That's true. There's only so many things you can cut out before you're like, forget it. So. That's right. Right. I have my healthier, smaller desserts, and my husband has his beer and wine. Whatever works. That's true. Just Whatever do works. do our best. Yes. All righty. Well, I appreciate it. And once again, have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Okay. All righty. Talk to you soon. You got it. Bye. Bye. Matt and I actually had two conversations on this topic, and I thought you might enjoy the first one we had where the app wasn't quite ready, and that's one of the reasons we did a second conversation. But there's some information in the next segment that we didn't discuss the second time around, so I included it as well. So if you're looking for a little bit more information, keep on listening. Tell you what, these last, well, yesterday, too, I saw two new articles um regarding specifically regarding exercise and growing new brain cells um, for cognitive you know impairment helping to prevent that the CDC just is coming out you know have some of that information still and then this other article regarding you know that I showed you about um, actually being able to possibly prevent it so man there's a ton of info now yeah I've noticed a lot more you know, information about healthy lifestyle, you know, the exercise, the eating, all of that stuff. They're really focused on that right now. And I'm wondering if that's, I'm, I know one person who had a family member that was really active that ended up with memory loss, but they also had 10 kids and a lot of struggles. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering If there was other less healthy lifestyle factors, you know, like stress and those type of things that we know are not good for us, that might have played a part. I mean, there's so many factors. I've actually been reading a book called The End of Alzheimer's, and it's a, a doctor who's been researching the disease for like 30 years, possibly slightly more. And he thinks there are 36 factors that we need to control, which is a lot. A lot of them are, you know, like blood pressure and hormone levels. A lot of them require not, well, detailed blood work and other medical stuff, but he that's where he's at. It's not one cause or two causes. He thinks there are like 36 major factors. So it's like, whoo, okay. <laughs> I'll stick right right now to going to the gym and riding my bike and eating healthy because that's a lot easier at the moment. But I am going, hopefully, at the beginning of the year to to my doctor and with his program and say, okay, this is where we need to go. Since I have the three generations behind me with the memory loss, uh, I don't need to take any any risks. So (laughs) the more the more we can learn about this, the better. So. Why don't you detail what, what you've read in the last couple weeks? The, what prompted you to reach out to me? Oh, so th- this one that I talked to you about and that you looked at um, what was a big one. You know, I'm on it right now where it says this may that one-third of dementia cases most likely can be prevented. I mean, that's according to the, the Lancet Commission in, in Denmark, but people are people, you know, humans. Right. Early intervention for hypertension, smoking, diabetes, obesity, depression, and hearing loss may slow or prevent disease development. So, I mean, that's a huge piece. Um, Let me open Feedly here where I saw the other one. Like that. Come on, computer. (laughs) <laughs> Technology can always be so much fun. It is. It is. Um, 
So if we, I'm, I'm pulling up notes I have. If we reduced dementia by one third, that would be, well, that would be almost 5 million less people by 2050. That's a lot. And that's just, I believe, in the United States. Okay. I have, and I'll have to pull it out and put it in the show notes, but I have a, I went to a conference where they talked about worldwide dementias and not just Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's and all dementias. And they were saying that if we reduced, well, if we prevented memory loss just for a year, it reduces the number of people that have dementias by almost 10 million people. So if that's worldwide, obviously. So if we reduce the actual disease by a third, that's like three and a half million people. That's a significant number. That's a huge significant number. <laughs> You're still looking for your article? Still looking for that article. It was in the Feedly. All right, so here's one of them here. Uh, how exercise generates new neurons, improved cognition. This is an Alzheimer's mouse, but it's still, you know, experiments. They had to mimic the beneficial effects of exercise, and this was done by Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and basically, they, they tried to say the investigation shows that those beneficial effects on cognition can be blocked by the hostile inflammatory environment present in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease and the physical exercise can, and this in quotations, clean up the environment, allowing new nerve cells to survive and thrive in improving cognition in the Alzheimer's mice. So obviously they're assuming that could happen in another mammal's brain. So what they're saying is exercise reduces inflammation and the inflammation is preventing better growth of new neurons. It's not preventing the growth or the creation of new brain cells completely. Right. The, the next sentence says, in our study, we show that exercise is one of the best ways to turn on neurogenesis. And then by figuring out the molecular and genetic events involved, we determine how to mimic the beneficial effects of exercise through gene therapy and pharmacological agents. But they could not... Um, completely take out exercise and, and just do it with drugs and gene therapy alone does it still doesn't do it. There's something that exercise does that cannot be replicated. Um, here we go. Although exercise induced AHN improved cognition in Alzheimer's mice by turn on neurogenesis, trying to achieve that result by using gene therapy and drugs did not help. So, so that was because newly born neurons induced by drugs and gene therapy were not able to survive in brain regions already ravaged by the Alzheimer's pathology, particular neuroinflammation, right? So we asked how neurogenesis uh, induced by exercise differs. It says we found the key difference was that exercise also turned on the production of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic trophic factor. Uh, known to be important for growth and survival of neurons, which created a more hospitable brain environment for the new neurons to survive. So you got to do all of it. It's, you know, you need the drugs, you need the gene therapy, but the exercise creating that hormone is massive. You know, without that, it, you can't. You know, you're just kind of going in in a circle. <laughs> That's no good. That's really fascinating. I'm wondering, having been seriously overweight having lost all the weight and then and getting going from being very happy sitting and reading and being very sedentary to if i don't go to the gym or out on my bike every morning it's not pretty i'm wondering if it has you know you get the endorphins that runners high that people yeah. hear about which i always thought was baloney i didn't didn't understand how anybody running would get like this happy feeling but i've experienced it not from running um from spin and I wonder that I wonder there's obviously some something that's going on inside our bodies and our brains that they can't mimic with drugs. That's really interesting. Which is I think is very positive because it's saying you, you can't just rely on drugs 
the rest of your life and, and think that's going to do it. You actually have to be out there and make a difference, move around, eat a little bit better, and obviously all the other risk factors, stroke, heart disease, death, uh, colon cancer, whatever else can fall into line. But um, yeah, drugs, drugs will not completely do it. So then the next thing was really kind of the best line in there. It says, um, uh, the lesson learned was that it was not just enough to turn on the birth of new nerve cells with the drugs. You must simultaneously, again, in quotations, clean up the neighborhood in which they're being born to make sure the new cells survive and thrive with the exercise. So it really is, here's your new cells. Let's get rid of the bad neighbors, you know, clean that out, the projects, rebuild <laughs> nice houses in there, bring in new neighbors, and uh, everybody gets along more. little brain gentrification going on. That's exactly what's happening. Oh, well, and exercise is a whole lot cheaper than pharma, pharma than prescription yep. drugs. Yep, and you don't and you don't need a uh, specific health insurance to exercise. That is true. Now I know the next question is going to be, well, what do we, what exercise do we have to do? And you know, there's obviously still some debate on that. We do have facts regarding um, what works as far as resistance exercise helps with a specific, you know. Uh, memory, short-term memory, what helps with uh, executive function. There are some things for that, but even then, it's still not specific as squats, <laughs> bench press, you know, CrossFit. So it doesn't get that detailed. What I've read is you just, you need to increase your heart rate to the point where you can speak but not sing. This is more right. in regards to, like, walking, but... That's, yeah. Yeah, that's called the rate of perceived exertion. Uh, another easy term is called the talk test, and that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, you don't need any fancy equipment if you're walking the dogs and you're able to carry on a conversation with your spouse or your neighbors or whatever, and easily, you're, you're not walking fast enough. Right, it's got to be a bit labored, but you should still be able to do so. Should be able to, yeah, maybe... Pause and take a deep breath and then continue. I live mm -hmm. in a hilly neighborhood, so and I've got three dogs of, like, basically three generations. I have one that's 15 months, one that's four, and one that's almost 11 with not great back legs at this point. So, you know, I have, I have that challenge, but he, the, even the old guy walks pretty fast, and when we come up the hill, it's a steep hill, so... <laughs> mm -hmm. You get a little out of breath, a little yep. puffing and puffing. So I know that's good for you, although, yep. you know, it's crazy. Is there, I've read in other articles where they suggest a minimum of half an hour a day, five to six days a week, but I've also read that they suggested that because the actual amount of time, which I believe is an hour a day, six days a week, was... They didn't want to overwhelm people with the suggestion, so they sort of dumbed it down. Have you read so any duration the, suggestions? Yeah, the CDC um, says that every human, you know, they say kid, really human, um, should have 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity exercise. Uh, you, we would love to have 60 minutes a day. It doesn't all have to be at one time. You know, it can add up. And even in their report, they talked about really the minimum bout you need is between 11 to 20 minutes. And then approximately that much time afterwards is when it, your brain is now an optimal for like academic performance or, or cognitive function. But it's really just that small of an amount and a little bit of that time later. And then your brain is primed for, you know, for usage, for like taking tests. Um, <laughs> maybe. That's interesting. I wonder why, what has led them down the path? I don't know if you've seen any reasons, but it in the last nine months to a year, I've just seen more and more about exercise, eating right, you know, all those, those, you know, quote unquote buzzwords. I wonder what, what's leading them down that path. 
Have you seen any I've, reasons that you that's that they're going that way or the common sense thing to me says there's some type of monetary reason. <laughs> I, well, what what it is as far as um, because people are spending too much on health care or not using health care, whatever it is, there's obviously some monetary value value that people are um, someone's losing out on. Hmm. Well, that's a good answer. And probably that's, true. Yeah. I, who, who is it? Who's the one actually losing? Uh, I don't know if we'll find out, but someone's losing billions of dollars in some way. And uh, how can we reroute it back to our pockets? Makes sense. That's kind of how this country works. Yeah, it so, is. Oh, I've seen you've had some posts on LinkedIn about, I'm going to pivot a little bit here, about mm-hmm. um, you have a balance, an exercise for balance program for seniors and I've worked with or talked to women that are older than me that get really fearful that they're going to fall so they they start putting their pants on by sitting down instead of you know hopping into your pants the way most of us do while you're standing and you know, they were very, this one particular gal was very adamant that, you know, as we get older, we needed to sit down and we needed to take all these precautions. And a friend of mine that was also there who is a retired geriatric nurse and myself, both, both of us said, no, 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 that's actually not correct because we lose balance as we age. So if we don't do things to counteract that loss, you're just going to get less stable and more sedentary as you move along. So can you tell me about your your program for, you know, incre- improving your balance? Because that's so crucial. Falls are actually a huge medical problem. They cause medical problems for a lot of seniors, which I'm sure you okay, know. Well, number one initial cause of death in over 65, because you're right, because they don't recover. It might not necessarily be the exact fall itself, but that – does something, but you break the hip and then it starts a chain reaction of events that they just can't recover from. But it started because of the fall. Yeah, I've heard people, you know, my aunt broke her hip and it was never the same and then died a year later. And it's like, man, breaking hips is really a bad thing. <laughs> breaking hips is really a bad thing. Um, or, you know, whatever it is, we just, the human body does not recover as, recover as fast. So if there's other if you had other issues, well, now it just accelerates those other issues. Um, so what our, our program does, and, and this, and I know the last time we talked, we really, I didn't really go into promoting Movement Academy. It was more from just a, a personal trainer standpoint. But our, that's what the Movement Academy program does. And right now we're in councils on aging here in Louisiana. And yes, we're looking to expand it for an individual purchase that someone can buy on a monthly subscription, you know, just debit from their credit card every month like everything else um but it works with things like dynamic movement uh object control balance and stability linear agility lateral agility as well as you know a type you know resistance training all from any device your computer your your tablet your phone and it's based on mobility level so whether you're chair based or Maybe you need a little bit of assistance walking or you're fully mobile like yourself. There's still exercises that have been built scientifically developed, not exercise that developed, but the system developed that builds upon itself through new phases that come to you every month. So it's always challenging. And it starts off with things just like with a, a two foot balance, you know, put spreading your feet wider than your shoulders, kind of moving the shoulder height to shoulder width and then having them touch. Um, you know, are you be able to do what's like a drop step? So you're standing in, uh, say, like an athletic position. Can you move your foot back and kind of open up your stance? Can you cross it over to actually doing things in motion? Like, can you do a side shuffle? Can you do a back pedal? You know, can you walk backwards? And progressing on these things is also fun, and it helps to improve your your balance along the way because that's what life is. You don't really think about that life is a side shuffle drop step hip turn but you you have to side shuffle to get out of your car then you kind of do a, a a crossover step maybe you know to get out and then close your door and um 
get back to walking towards your house. So just those little steps are where we fall. So by intentionally practicing those types of movements, you're going to have less chance to actually fall when doing that, getting out of your car, for example. Do you have anything that is specific? Because I did a an episode in July on home safety, and I was shocked to learn that the bedroom is the second most dangerous place in the house. Well, maybe it's the third. You know, the bathroom is obviously terrible because it's wet and steamy and hard surfaces, right. and kitchens are bad because, you know, you've got heat yep. and fire and other dangerous things. But because people go from laying down in bed to sitting up, sometimes they do it too quickly and they get dizzy. So do you have anything that's that focuses on that movement, you know, like sitting up yeah, properly? That's- that's all under the umbrella of something called executive function. Mm-hmm. And that's where things like just doing a, a resistance training um, helps. And, and I do have all that information I'll tell you right now. But yeah, executive function is an umbrella of terms that falls under things like brushing your teeth, putting your clothes on, getting out of bed, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, hold on, let me pull it up here. Yeah, it's, you know, you don't really think of your home as being a dangerous place until you have mobility or balance issues. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed because all of the trainers and instructors I've worked worked out with have been older than myself. Uh Uh-huh. Well, they're, they're at least my age. And they all focus on they there's always a balance component in all the workouts you know because they know how important it is so i i feel like i got a good start before i even knew why it was important i got a good start on that you know and i do things like i try to sit up from laying down just using my abs because that's actually not easy but sometimes i have a dog laying across my chest that makes it impossible (laughs) yes all right, so, so exercises have been shown to improve executive functions, memory, and speed of processing. So it says studies shown benefits in memory functions. Uh, All right, here we go. Resistance training has improved executive functions as well as short-term memory and attention. And then there's a whole bunch of cited articles. Coordination training improves complex body movements. Strength slash resistance training, coordination training, and cardiovascular training affect different neurocognitive networks. So doing resistance training is what's going to help with the executive function, as we talked about, which is, like I said, getting out of bed, putting your clothes on, brushing your teeth, um, brushing your hair, (laughs) wiping your butt, stuff like that. I mean, that's, yeah. Now, can you can you define resistance training for me? That's different than strength training, isn't it? No, it's, no? it's definitely the same thing. Okay, because that we I always hear it as strength training, and so I was not sure if resistance training was the same or not. So that's useful. Resistance can be also the weight of your body. I mean, and as, as strength also depends on what level that you're on, as far as your conditioning. Doing a push-up. How many people cannot do a push-up out there in, in real-world land? A ton. You know, that's a resistance training exercise. And there's planks are really good for you, and you can do them kind of anywhere. Unless you have three golden retrievers like me, and you get on the floor, and they think you want to play, so they knock you over. <laughs> right, right. But that, and that, that's, that's other problems. Yes. You have but, to close uh, the door so you can do your plank. And yes. I just read an article where it says Cher, who is 72, can do a one-minute plank. I actually think she does them longer. Oh, I'm sure she can do a lot longer than that. Yeah, I thought somewhere I read it was more like seven minutes. But this one particular article said, you know, Cher at, at 72 can do yeah. a plank for one minute. Can you? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. There, I don't there's... like it, but I can. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of 72-year-olds that cannot. There's a lot of so, 72-year-olds that wouldn't be able to get down on the floor like that and then be able to get back up. 
No. And that's really a part of the program, too, that progresses the person to doing that. First, we have to balance them and stabilize them. And then as the phases go on through the program, yep, you're going to have to get on the floor and do movements on the floor to get up because that's part of the balance training is, okay, great. We want, hopefully you don't fall, number one. But if you do, you got to get up. So the goal is to at least give you the strength. All right, you fell. Uh, so part A failed. You can't just lay on the ground because the more you lay on the ground, if you're bleeding or whatever it may be, you're just in a worse position. So you got to get up. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and, and that's what also the program is, to, to give that so they can at least stand back up. Yeah, I have crappy knees, so standing back up is always challenging, but I can do it. It's right. just not graceful. Well, <laughs> at that point, you've lost the grace. <laughs> if, you, if you fell, you've lost the grace. That's so. true. That is true. I did trip and fall when I was in Toronto in June, and that was more embarrassing than anything else. But I don't, I don't even know what I tripped over, but next thing I know, I felt myself. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm about to hit the pavement, and I did. I hit my knee, which, of course, doesn't help. But I was able to pop back up, you know, immediately, which I know in a lot of cases you don't want to do because you need to assess that you haven't damaged anything. Well, All I damaged which, was my pride. Yeah, <laughs> which sometimes hurts more. Yes. But you, you, get, you can't, you still got to uh, assess in motion if, so you're not lying in the street with a bus uh, <laughs> impending doom on your face. That is very true. Um. You know, a set, your, your broken leg is much better than your face being smashed. Yeah, I'll take a broken leg over being run right. over by a bus. Yeah, me too. Every and I, day. I've only had one broken bone. It was my collarbone, which was really atrocious. I would rather not break anything ever again. But, yeah, that's better than a bus running over you. Yep. <laughs> yep. So there you have it. Even more information on the benefits of exercise and cognitive health. Definitely check out Movements Academy's Active Aging app. It sounds fantastic, and I wish it was something I could do with my mom, but she's advanced in the disease enough that pretty sure she'll just resist. I may try some simple movements with her, and if she's agreeable, then I'm definitely downloading the app. Make sure to type in the word memory for your 50% off your first month. That's good through the end of October 2018. Now, stay tuned because coming up, I also have something else I'm going to share with you. Don't forget to check out the newer page on the Fading Memories podcast website. It's my, quote, favorite things page. It's a link to the Amazon pages of all of the books and other things I've found helpful over the years. It's a personal collection that I think you will find useful, and I hope you check it out. One last thing before I sign off for today, great listeners. As you may know, I really enjoy listening to podcasts. I listen to them while I cook and while I edit portraits, and I wanted to share a teaser clip of one of my favorites with you. It's called Piping Hot Tea. It's funny. It makes me laugh every day when I'm listening, and I wanted you to be able to enjoy it as well. So stay tuned for their teaser. Hey, everyone. I'm Vince. And I'm Emily, and we are hosts of Piping Hot Hot Tea. Tea. Piping Hot Tea is a comedy podcast where we discuss anything and everything. You will not find another podcast like us. We bring you fresh, new, off-the-wall topics that are relatable and fun. You can listen to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter for episode updates, debates, and so much more. If you want to connect with us, use the hashtag Piping Hot Podcast. You may hear us fight sometimes because we pretty much fight in every episode. Seriously? Did you have to bring that up in the promo? What? Honestly. Did you... Okay, well, you might as well just end it. Okay. Okay. There's so much useful information out there and so much we need to know to take care of our parents and our own families. And I know sometimes it's really hard to gather all this information together in a short period of time in a way you can access easily. And that's the whole point of this podcast. I share what I've learned taking care of my parents and especially my mom and all the researching of information I do for these podcast episodes. 
I hope you're finding them useful and hopefully a little entertaining as well. If you are, could you do me a favor? Can you go to Apple iTunes and leave a rating or even a quick review? This is how new people find my podcast, and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know about me. As always, I'll chat with you again next week. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbkseniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400.